You know, thankful again to Janice this morning for outlining our vision and mission. And for those of you who were able to see it and to listen to that presentation, you may have heard within the vision um, that we have chosen for our church that our vision is to use our God-given gifts and the word of the Lord to serve our community by feeding the body and nourishing the spirit. We begin by talking about the God-given gifts because everything about the service of God should be done and empowered by God himself. Never should a church rely on talents or good thoughts in order to serve God. That is a formula for burnout. That is also a formula for doing things in the flesh. But God is calling us to walk in the spirit and God is calling us to function in the spirit. That's a part of the way in which we are actually effective in what we do. God wants you and me to discover what our God-given gifts are. And in order to do that, we have to look into the word of God and we have to find out what God says are the gifts that he gives to us. Last week, I began this topic on spiritual gifts by introducing what they are. And basically, a spiritual gift is a supernatural enablement or supernatural ability that God has given you to carry out his work through his church. And he has given you, if you consider yourself a Christian, he has given you a gift, maybe multiple gifts. And it is in discovering what your gift is and functioning in that gift that will be a blessing to this church and it will be a blessing to the community. And so for the next few weeks, we will be looking at what those gifts are. And this morning, we will start off with the first two in the list given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says in verse 4 of that chapter, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. For to one is given the spirit, through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. The title of my message today is Spiritual Gifts, Words of Wisdom and Knowledge. Let's pray. Father, in these few moments, explain to us what is meant by a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. Logos Sophia's Words of Wisdom. Logos, Gnosios, words of knowledge. There is nowhere else in the Bible that you can find these particular words uttered. And they are uttered for a reason. If you read in the Old Testament books like Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Songs of Solomon, we call those books the wisdom books or the poetry books. Those are the books that teach us what a wise life looks like. And you can read those books in order to understand what God wants you to do and what God doesn't want you to do. Because wisdom is at the heart of pleasing God. Now, it's quite possible that every single one of us here, well, I know for certain, every single one of us here are called to live a wise life. To live a life in which we are knowledgeable about God. However, there is a special enablement given to particular individuals by the Spirit of God in order to demonstrate wisdom and knowledge where they are needed to edify and to build up the church of Jesus Christ. And I'll give you an example of this. When I was a young man, I began to really scrutinize the Bible. And as I read the Bible, I kind of noticed something. In the Old Testament, God seems to be pretty angry all the time. God seems to be doing things that seem to, to be, uh, you know, a bit violent, a, a bit, you know, serious for those who disobey him. 
But I don't see that same God in the New Testament. I see a God that is loving and forgiving and caring and teaching. And my thought was, why is that? Why is there such a difference between the way God behaved in the Old Testament and the New Testament? So as a young man, I went to my leader. I went to a deacon. And I said, can you explain to me why it seems that God is different in the Old Testament and, and um, from, from his behavior in the New Testament? And with a smile on his face, he sat me down in the first pew and he said to me, Andrew, 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 you're going to have to learn, Andrew. The Bible, you can't really take it as being true in every respect. Instead, you need to see the Bible more as a guide than an authoritative statement about God's will for your life. In other words, don't take the study of God too seriously. Just, just calm down and whatever you don't understand, just ignore it and keep going. Now run along, young man, and go serve the Lord. Now, as you can imagine, hearing that, I was deeply disturbed. Because instead of answering my question, he just brought more questions to mind and made me a bit more conflicted in my faith. And it deeply disturbed me because this was somebody that I kind of looked up to. This is somebody I thought to myself I could learn something from. And his answer to my questions about the Old and the New Testament was, you figure it out, go ahead. And my thought was, wow, now I don't, I know I'm not just dealing with the issue of the difference between God in the Old and New Testament. Now I'm having a crisis of faith because now he's brought into question the idea that God could be lying to me and that God is probably not who he says he is as revealed in the scriptures. And for two weeks, I literally went through a, a silent crisis in my Christian walk. Now, I was going to church during those two weeks. And at the time, I was in Jamaica and my church. We used to have our youth meetings on a Friday night. And I was in the executive of my youth, of my youth um, committee. And I would go and I would do the things just like I usually did. But this one Friday night... Two weeks after this man told me this crazy thing, my youth pastor looks at me and says, Andrew, what's wrong? And I said, no, nothing's wrong. And he held me by the shoulder and he said, Andrew, I sense that there is something wrong. What's going on? And I said, you know, I was wondering why he, he pushed a little bit to find out what was going on with me. And I said, well, maybe I'll, I'll tell him what's going on. So I told him. I said, I went to somebody and asked them about God and the difference between God in the Old and the New Testament, and they just made me more confused. He said, stop right there. Come with me. And he took me to his office, and he said, bring your Bible. Took me to his office and sat me down. So I thought, okay. So he said, what's your concern? And I said to him, you know what? I feel like I'm struggling with the idea that the Bible is true. Because this man told me that it's not really true. It's kind of what you make it. And he said to me, turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And I did as he said. He said, read it. And I said, okay. It says there, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He said, stop. Say it again. Read it again. And I read it again. He said, read it one more time. And I read it one more time. And he said, what is it saying? It's saying here that everything about Scripture is God-breathed. And he said, good. Now, what else did the guy say to you? So I said, okay, um, well, you know, I was struggling with this whole idea of not understanding why God behaves in one way here and another way in the New Testament. And he said to me, Andrew, let me ask you a simple question. 
what is the greatest commandment God gave us? And at the time, I couldn't figure out what he was trying to get at. He asked me again, what is the greatest commandment? I didn't understand. And he took me to a passage of scripture, and it said there that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your might, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, read it again. So I read it again. And he said, read it one more time. And I read it one more time. And he said to me, there are things about God you will never be able to understand until you commit yourself to pursuing God. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to, every day for the coming week, you are going to wake up and pray. At noontime, you're going to pray. And at nighttime, you're going to pray. And you're going to study the Bible first thing in the morning and first thing at night. And then next week, Friday, you're going to come back to me and tell me the difference between God in the Old Testament and God in the New Testament. So I thought to myself, well, that's is weird. You're not answering my question, but I'm going to do what you said. Well, guess what, guys? In one week, I came back to him excited. And he said to me, what did you learn this week, Andrew? And I said, guess what? I just understood this. You see, God is the same God. And in the Old Testament, he's trying to live with men, sinful men and women. And because of that, his wrath, his holiness rose up against them. And this is the reason why you see him in so many ways upset in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has shed his blood so that his blood can be a covering for us and a protection for us from the wrath of God's holiness. So now God doesn't judge us in the same way. Why? Because if we know him, he will see the blood that is upon our lives and he will be merciful and gracious to us. And he said, say that again. <laughs> And again, he said, do you understand? And I said, yes. And he said, okay. Well, that young man is what you should do every single time you have a problem with the scriptures. Study it. Study it. Look deeper. Don't just have a thought and ask somebody for their help and understanding it. God wants to teach you, but you have to pursue God. Why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story to show the difference between someone who is trying to give you information from their understanding and someone who is trying to give you information in a way that God has gifted them to. That youth pastor used words of wisdom and knowledge to help me to grow in my faith. Someone who did not use wisdom and knowledge almost got me to a place where I gave up on God. But someone rightly applying the word of God through wisdom and knowledge helped me to become a stronger Christian. You see, my friends, one of the big reasons why I am so focused on spiritual leadership in our church is because it is at the heart of developing strong Christians who will do the will of God the way God wants it to be done. That is why. It's not because I'm so interested in changing things. No, God is interested in changing things, but God wants things to change his way. And if we want to understand the things that God has for us, we need to be operating in the gifts of the Spirit. We need to be operating in a way that God has told us that he has commissioned us to operate. In that moment, I understood the power of a right word and a wrong word. Wrong words can lead you to a place of unbelief. Right words will strengthen your faith and make you a better Christian. And what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that, listen, there are utterances given to you as a Christian. Utterances that the Spirit of God will give to your heart to help other people to be stronger in their faith. If every time you open your mouth and people, people feel discouraged about serving God, you need to check yourself. 
Because God has given us wisdom and knowledge so that we might build each other up. So that today I might be a stronger Christian than I was yesterday. And it is identifying our gift. That, my friends, is what's going to help us to be able to lift each other up and build each other up to do the work of the ministry, which, by the way, we should all be involved in. Doing what God told us to do. So you might say, Pastor, well, what is the difference between a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge? Well, let me help you understand in just a few moments here. A word of wisdom. Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge that you have for the blessing of others and for the glory of God. I want to say it again. Wisdom is the proper application of the knowledge that you have for the blessing of others and for the glory of God. Now, wisdom is a word that is used both in church and out of church. Now, let me talk about the wisdom that, you know, we use out of church a lot. The wisdom of this world is for self-benefit. It is for self-aggrandizement. It is so that I may give you information that's going to be pertinent to whatever it is I am guiding you into. That's fine, and that's useful for out there. But generally speaking, it's not for the glory of God. It is for the glory of the giver, the one who gives the information. Unfortunately, that same humanistic idea of wisdom has invaded our churches too, where sometimes people aren't really interested in the glory of God. They just want to be wise so people can look at them and say, oh, you're such a smart person. But in the church of Jesus Christ, wisdom is different. Wisdom is not for me. Wisdom is for you. And wisdom is for the glory and honor of God. That's what it is. Properly applying knowledge so that other people may benefit. So that other people may grow in their faith and understanding of God. James chapter 3 verse 17 says, The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. That is what wisdom is from God. Jesus said this about the blessing of wisdom when confronted with people who don't mean you any good. He says in Luke chapter 21 verse 15, I myself will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. And I've found that in my life, you've been in, in discussions with people and to give them spiritual wisdom and to watch it land in their hearts and minds and to see people who were previously lost and blind see their eyes open immediately before your eyes over something that you know did not come from your mind, but it came from the mind of God. That is the power of wisdom. God's wisdom, spiritual wisdom, it will open eyes that are blind. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 1 says, Who is like the wise? Who knows the explanation of things? A person's wisdom brightens their face and changes its hard appearance. You know, my, my whole goal in life is to be so wise that every time someone speaks to me, they feel better. <laughs> they, if they're going through a difficulty or a problem, whenever they talk to me, I am giving forth the wisdom of God and it changes their countenance and makes their day brighter. You see, that is a part of the reason why God gives us his mind, his wisdom, because he wants us to be encouragers and edifiers of one another. If every time someone comes to you, they feel less encouraged than they came to you, something is wrong. Something must be wrong. Because God has given us his spirit for the purpose of joy and peace and all the fruit that we have already talked about when we studied the fruit of the Spirit. That's why he gave us his Spirit, to lift each other up, to bless one another. That's what wisdom is. 
God may give you the opportunity to build into someone's life. And in order to truly build into their life, he might have endowed you with a word of wisdom, some insight that can help them, some insight they never saw before that can help them get through what they're going through, that can help them become a stronger believer. If you are gifted with that, use it. Use it. Because in the end, God wants us to be a blessing to one another. And the wiser I am is the better I will serve Almighty God. So use the word of wisdom to bless your brother and sister. Don't discourage them by telling them things that God didn't say. That man was a deacon and he, he nearly led me astray. He needed wisdom. And thank God for my youth pastor. He had a little bit and he shared it with me. And that's why I'm here today. Because he used the word of wisdom. Proper application of the knowledge that he had. The second thing, finally, the word of knowledge. What is the difference between a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge? Well, knowledge is information that gives you insight into the things of God. I'll say it again. Knowledge is information that gives you insight into the things of God. Sometimes knowledge is ready-made. Whenever you read the Bible, God is giving you knowledge of himself. So reading the Bible is part of the way in which we get knowledge about God. But the gift of spiritual knowledge, the gift of the word of knowledge, is not just about reading the word of God. Sometimes the Holy Spirit within you will give you insight directly into what people need to hear. Have you ever been in a church service where the pastor is preaching and it sounds like he's preaching about you? I know I have. I remember distinctly one time in Jamaica, I, I preached a message, and after the service, I see this lady coming up, and she looked angry. I'd never seen her before in my life. She looked angry. And she came to me, and she said, can I speak with you a moment? And she took me over to a corner, and she said, listen, listen, Pastor Andrew, I don't know how you know me, but you need to stop talking about me in your sermons. And I said, ma'am, I don't even know your name. <laughs> I've never even seen you before in my life. And I had no idea that you were in the service today, and I thank you for coming. That's what I said, because I truly did not know. Let me tell you something, my friends. There is something supernatural that happens whenever we exercise our spiritual gifts. Sometimes God will give insight about things that we don't have any idea about. Sometimes I am preaching a message that had something to do with me and what I was going through, and God used it very, in a very specific way in someone else's life. How does that work? It works that way because it is the Holy Spirit, God himself, who is able to use the word of God and to speak directly to something that you are going through. I don't know anything about you. I don't build sermons around people. God is the one who speaks as I exercise the prophetic gift he has given me. That's how it works. My friends, there are things about this Christian life that go deeper than your understanding. This is one of those things. The word of knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit to address you where you are. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with anybody around here. It has to do with God giving insight. And God does that regularly in my life. Have you ever been speaking to someone? And in the midst of you talking about, talking around an issue, they say to you, listen, I believe God is saying that the issue is this thing. And it touches directly on what you've been trying to ignore in your life. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been there? I have. Where God gives somebody insight out of the clear blue into the big problem that you're dealing with in your life. That, my friends, is the word of knowledge. Where the Holy Spirit gives insight into the heart and life of the believer so that we might minister blessing and encouragement to one another. 
It's not a, it's not a magic trick in order to get people amazed about us, us. It is a way in which the Spirit of God works to build up the family of God. Every time I'm standing at this pulpit and you hear me say something that is addressing something directly in your heart and in your life, remember this, God loves you. That's why he brought it out. He loves you. That's the reason it came to you. Because God does not want us to live ignoring the things that are of most importance to him. That is the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge. Proverbs 2 verse 6 says, For God gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 15, 14, the discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly. Knowledge is important to us doing the work of God. Why? Because we need insight to be able to understand what is happening spiritually around us. There are deeper things that are happening than somebody just having a bad day. Sometimes people's spirits are being oppressed Sometimes people are feeling suicidal. And God wants us as Christians not just to give them a nice hello, hi, and be polite to them. God wants us to be able to minister to the needs of their heart. That's why we need to operate in the gift of the Spirit, the insight that he gives. I'll close with this. If you believe that you have the gift of word of wisdom or word of knowledge, Here's how you develop it. You develop it in the same way that we develop all our gifts. And that is, we need to pursue God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. The big reason why many of us have never seen a miracle in our lives is not because God is not working. It is because we are not serious about our faith. Or we see our faith as something that we can pass on or something that we don't have to be serious about and disciplined about. And then we wonder why we're confused about the things of God and confused when we read the Bible. It's not because God is not speaking. It's because we are not listening. It is pursuing God that gives us insight into the deeper things of God and that develops the gifts that we have. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A begin, beginning of knowledge, I'm sorry. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if I want to develop the gift of wisdom in my life, if I want to develop the gift of knowledge in my life, I must reverence God. I must fear God. I must be pursuing God. How can anyone be a spiritual leader if they're not pursuing God in their hearts? How can anyone encourage anyone in the faith if you're not pursuing God in the heart? You want to reverence God? Study. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth and being honest and open about sharing your gifts with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Can you imagine a church where everyone is functioning in the gift that God has given them? I see that church as a very powerful place, a place in which God is working miracles. I see that church as a place where people are being lifted up to a higher place, a higher place a higher call in their spiritual living. And that is the best that we are called to be in a church like this. I want to encourage you to come out every week and to learn about the gifts of the Spirit. We've covered two today in a very quick manner. If you need more information about this, I'm here. Utilize me. I got some gifts. I want to use them to build you up, to make you stronger in your faith. Amen? Amen? Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this truth. Thank you so much for this church. I pray if there's anyone in this church who has the blessing of a word of wisdom, the blessing of a word of knowledge, I pray, Lord God, that you would develop those gifts. And I pray, Lord God, that you would utilize those gifts to build up our church. 
Father God, help us to pursue you with our whole soul, mind, and strength, and to watch you do supernatural things in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.